All right. We are back with Muhammad. You're, you're really getting into it. Um, I'll just let you pick it up where you, where you left off because I was basically in a trance um, trying to digest all of this. You know, I, I see it funny because I was just saying this is bitah, and if we change the B to F, it will be fatah means the beginning or the opener. <laughs> and I think now we are starting with him as in the beginning. So. Yeah, a new beginning. <laughs> yes, a new beginning. Uh, Bitah is a, is a great uh, philosophy to uh, the ancient Egyptians and the modern Egyptians. And we will know later that uh, Bitah is the wife, uh, his wife is Sekhmet, this uh, global uh, energy, female energy, very strong female energy. And the Sekhmet is considered as one of the uh, mothers and in, in some... Uh, uh, stories she is the strong beam uh, of the sun and we find that she married to Bitah, the wise man the the quiet man which in my opinion makes great harmony if you have such great power like Sikmet you need someone can deal with this anger with this energy uh, so the best one dealing with Sikmet is definitely Bitah. Bitah, if you look to his shape, is unique. He is unique creature. His body is like a mummy, so we can say he is dead. But his face is like a living face. So he is as a middle stage between death and life. He's like a gate between both. But the ancient Egyptians didn't say death, by the way. They imagined, or not imagined, they, they are sure that this is uh, uh, moving to a different story, different uh, trip. So we have a trip on this planet, Earth, and then there is another trip in uh, uh, the Egyptian call it the uh, underworld. Or in my opinion, it is where the cosmic phenomenon happened. Because when we see uh, in the tombs of the Valley of the Kings, we see that they put the spirit uh, in a boat with all the uh, elements of the cosmos like uh, the stars and like the uh, uh, especially like Sirius star like uh, planets um, uh, and some of un unknown uh, personalities and they imitate the circle of the sun the day uh, the daily movement from east to west so it means that they were talking or they were trying to tell us that the spirit of the human is leaving this planet and is taking a journey in a different dimension. So I think Bitah is the connection between our dimension now and this second dimension. And I was just explaining that he has all the samples of powers. The jet pillar was the, the this, uh, marks, okay? And the ankh, which is not very clear, but you can see it just in the middle, uh, looks like uh, an oval shape. And the was scepter, the scepter of power. And he gave those scepters not to the Egyptian kings, he gave it to the knitters. And from the knitters, the Egyptian kings got those samples. Okay. We talk about now deeper layers of what we studied in schools and what we know from the mainstream stories. When they say ancient Egypt, they always talk about 3200 BC till 200 or 300 BC. And then they can talk with you about some 300 or 400 or even 1000 years older uh, as a preparation to the civilization. Uh, primitive people came from the desert, they start to form small villages and then towns and then cities. So in total we can talk about the Egyptian history uh, about 5000 BC. But is this true? Is there older or, or deeper layer? Let's see, I made three titles, main titles, Dynastic Egypt, which I considered all what we studied about ancient Egypt is dynastic Egypt. 
all the stories of the kings and the pharaohs happened in dynastic Egypt. And then there is pre-dynastic Egypt. This is, yes, the, the preparation. But the preparation is not 4,000 BC or 5,000 BC. I see it right after the cataclysm, the rainy season, when that great flood destroyed the civilizations of the whole world, not only Egypt, maybe the one in Mexico, the one in uh, Turkey, and we have seen Gebliki Tibi. Also, uh, I heard the, the Dr. Robert Schock talking about it, and it has the same time frame of the uh, uh, the, uh, the rainy season. And uh, some civilizations could be in uh, South America, maybe in Asia. So they had, all of them had new beginning right after that rainy season. So when we say pre-dynastic, we shall talk about at least 9,000 BC. Then the pre-cataclysm. What was the story? What was the shape of Egypt before the rainy season? This is what we will talk about. So number one, here is the question. Dynastic Egypt, is it 3,500 BC, like the mainstream stories? Or is it 11,000 BC according to science? the cataclysm and from the rainy season, or is it 336,000 BC? So I just explained 3,500, this is the mainstream and how we reach this number by counting from what we call it king lists. This king ruled for five years, this one for six years, this one for 10 years. So we started to count how many years and we reached the time 3,500 BC. And then according to geology, we have the, the date 11,000 BC. From where we got 36,000 BC. Actually from two major Egyptian sources, Turin Papyrus and Manitoun, the one, the priest who lived during the Greek time and he wrote a book about Egypt. And he said that he told his king that the first Egyptian king was 36,000 before you. That king was Ptolemy II, and he was around uh, 300 BC. So we're talking about 36, 300 BC. So is it one source? No, I just said two sources. And then we have Turin Papyrus King List. There is a big papyrus in Turin City, in Turin Museum in Italy. And it listed that the knitters and another type of humans called Simshu, Shimsu Her, followers of Horus. Remember when I said when they created Horus, they, were, they started the patriarchy. <coughs> so the Shimsu Horus and the knitters ruled together with the, uh, the, the, the time or the, the time period of the Egyptian rulers. When we count them, count that, we reach the same number, 36,000 BC. So, but Egyptologists didn't uh, agree with this and they said it is exaggerations. That Manitoun was exaggerating. He was trying to impress the king, the foreign king, the Greek king. And Turin Papyrus is talking about some child stories. It is something um, mystical beings and we cannot be sure uh, that this is true or not, which uh, I, I don't agree with this at all. Like, how come you suspect such great evidence? You know, if we suspect Manitoun, it means we destroy the Egyptian history because Manitoun is the father of the Egyptian history. All our books and our references and our evidences, everything come from Manitoun stories. So if we suspect him, it means we delete all what we know about ancient Egypt. And we, if we suspect a very respectable source like Turin Papyrus, we can suspect anything else. And then we will have no rules, no basis for the Egyptian civilization. That's why I'm against what they say completely. Okay, pre-dynastic Egypt. This is also, I can see it as uh, something was invented to make our minds always stuck with a certain date. When we say pre-dynastic, it means something before the dynastic. And we just said the dynastic is officially 3,500 BC. So pre-dynastic will be close to this time. I cannot tell you 3,500 BC 
And then when you, uh, when I ask you, when will be the pre-dynastic, you tell me 50,000 BC. Your mind will not reach, will be close to 4,000, 5,000. So this is the term they invented also to stuck our minds with 3,500 BC. This is type of art of what we call it pre-dynastic. Who are the pre-dynastic? They are the primitive people were uh, gathering and trying to create civilization. And they did great job and they created the dynasty's civilization. But let's compare their art and the development of the art of uh, with different type of art we will see later. So this is from clay, uh, red clay, which is great piece for, for that time, okay? There was no proper tools. There was no uh, time actually for entertainment. They were fighting animals. They were fighting themselves. They were trying to find food and shelter. So to have art like this is something great. And another type of jars, long guan, not perfect neck. Uh, they made some art also not very uh, clear, but we can see that this is hippopotamus. We can see some wavy lines could be the Nile. And there is another big jar in the uh, backside. Uh, here at the beginning, a jar with lots of triangles on top of it. So can we call those triangles pyramids or mountains? Egyptologists call it mountains. And I call it pyramids. The judgment here that we don't have mountains in Egypt. So how come the ancient Egyptian saw mountains and draw mountains? And to be honest and clear, we do have some mountains, some, not many, some mountains in the northeast of Egypt, which is Sinai. It's a very far location from the valley, the Nile Valley. In the valley, we have zero mountains. And when I say zero, it is true, zero mountains. We have only small hill uh, in uh, east of Cairo. And that's why we call it mountain, mistakenly, because we don't know what does it mean mountain. So we call that small hill, we call it mountain. So who made this jar? He saw pyramids. But pyramids in the pre-dynastic time, very strange. And how, how old are some of these jars that you found? They're really old, right? Some of them 4,000 BC, 5,000 BC. Wow. Okay. And the first pyramid, according to Egyptology, was built 2,600 BC. So if we admit that the first pyramid was built at this time, so this jar was made 1,400 1, years before the pyramid was built. But it seems that it is not true. We can see many pyramids on top of the jar. Uh, also, we can see some animals. Uh, some people can call it mystical animals. Maybe it's not mystical. It is regular animals, but because the one who made it is not a good uh, sculpture. So we can easily say this is, could be a cow. This is, could be a hippo, the big one. But I'm trying to show you that type of art during this time. Because we will see later different pieces. And unfortunately, they are calling those pieces, they are dating them to the same time period of those things. Okay. Uh, this is from uh, hard stone uh, or not hard stone, but harder than limestone called chest. It's like gray uh, marble. We can say they made elephant. That shape of animal is an elephant. And this is an evidence I use that we did have elephants in ancient Egypt. Like the story of Dr. Robert Chuck, uh, and he uses ge geology, we need a zoologist, someone aware with animals, and can tell us when the Egyptian environment was suitable to have elephants. Because the, the regular Egypt we know, even from the dynasties, wasn't good environment for elephants, and giraffes, and lions. Those animals, I'm pretty sure they were uh, in, inside the Egyptian environment, okay? So this is, can take us back to the story of 36,000 BC. 
This is Flinders Petrie, an English uh, Egyptologist. He, this man was brilliant. He made uh, eras of the pre-dynastic. He didn't consider the word pre-dynastic as one uh, time period. He made uh, some, um, according to different types of jars and the technology was used in each uh, group of them. He made uh, different levels or different frames for the so-called pre-dynastic. This is very interesting. This is also pre-dynastic piece and we can see two pyramids in the middle and two suns, one in the, in the right side, one in the left side. And the one in the right side was covered with some mud to show sunset. And I don't know what the, the wavy line could be the Nile water or could be energy. But I see it very clear message that the one who made this wasn't doing any silly art. He was drawing pyramids. And you can see, look to the pyramid shape, the triangle with the blocks. So he was trying to show us the blocks, not just a regular mountain as Egyptologists claim. Ah, this is one of the pieces was found in a similar tomb with the pottery. This piece, unfortunately the picture is not great, but this piece is, uh, there is a bend in the stone. This is not plastic. This is not cartonage. This is schist stone. So how come those primitive people who are hardly dealing with clay and mud, they can make a bend and, and like a, a wavy shape for the base of this piece. Other pieces were found also in the same location, jars from brass from alabaster, which is hard material to carve. They need proper tools to do this. Maybe I, I don't say they need uh, uh, advanced tools, but at least they need iron tools. They need some tools like chisels. You know, we make fun of, of the story of the chisel, but now I can tell you, okay, if they tell me they had a chisel in those days, I would agree. But even a chisel wasn't existed yet during that time. So how come they made this thing, these things? Look to this one. Again, this is not plastic again. This is not cartonite. This is alabaster stone. So look how they made the wavy shape of the edges. I think this is something we cannot do nowadays. We, like, we need a, a quiet time and a professional, talented uh, workman to do this. But how come those primitive people did this kind of uh, basket? This is the twin of, of the previous pictures we saw, but from clay, from mud, which for me, it makes 100% sense, okay? But I can deal with the mud when it is uh, still flexible. And then after I do make the shape, they put it in a hot oven and it creates this. But to compare it with this, which is made from uh, hard stone, no, there is no chance to accept that the man who made this one is the same one who made that one. Ah. Now we come to a harder stone, granite stone. Okay, with extra hard work, which is uh, gold. What decorates the hands are real gold, is real gold. So how come the primitive people managed to take or to uh, abstract gold from the soil or from the, the rocks and then they use it to decorate uh, this jar which is made from hard type of granite we call it gray granite and sometimes we call it granodurite because it is extra type of granite and by the way it is very soft from outside and from inside also not only outside but also the inside of it and it takes the same shape. It is hollow from inside with the same style, not just a, a pit in the middle. Okay, the, the same curve from inside is hollow. How come primitive people who didn't have any chisel yet or any hammer can do this? 
Okay, not only doing hard things, but also their philosophy. This is, and, and I made sure to take a picture to the label also. So when I say they call it the cosmic cow, it is not me who is saying this. Egyptologists who are saying this. So they admit the truth here. Okay, so this is the cosmic cow. What does it mean, the cosmic cow? This is the galaxy, our galaxy, the Milky Way. Okay, and the word cow here, which is equivalent to our word Milky Way because it is something connected with that ancient concept, the cosmic cow. Okay, so the ancient Egyptians were not just looking to the sky uh, because it, it looks blue and looks nice and in the evening there are bright stars. No, they were aware with uh, a, a, a term called galaxy. They were aware with this and they made a representation of it. So this is not, definitely not pre-diagnostic. This is from the earlier advanced civilization. This is another piece of the same hard type of granite. And I brought this piece because when I took picture of it, my flesh went accidentally. So you can see the reflection of the flesh on the stone. You can see that this, the, the surface is super uh, shiny. That's why it managed to reflect the light, which is something you don't see if, we, if you are using primitive tools at the claim. Okay, this was made by advanced tool. Now we come to different type of stones. You know, we have what we call it Mohs scale of solidness from zero to 10. Zero is uh, gypsum, 10 is diamond, okay? So any of, uh, of the levels can scratch the, the one before. So diamond can scratch the, the first nine and number nine can scratch number uh, eight and like this, okay? So to scratch diamond, you need something harder or to scratch number nine, you need number 10, right? only scratch I'm not talking about shaving and cutting yet so what is number nine number nine is called corundum corundum stone it's a stone filled with ashes of iron that's why it is very hard stone this is my friend this is corundum stone this vase or I don't know how to call it towel is made from corundum so the pre-dynastic people they had the technology to cut and shape corundum, which we will suffer much with our modern technology to do something like this. Yeah, that's amazing. I want to just talk on that for just one sec, because that was a, a point that a lot of people were making was this particular stone. So are you saying that right now, that if we tried with our technology to, to recreate that, we we can do it or we would just really struggle to do it because they were talking about the smoothness, the shape, um, and how it was just textured perfectly, you know, in every way. It's, it's like they're masterfully built. Look, uh, to be honest, we can. With our modern technology, we can do 90% of what we can see in ancient Egypt. Okay. And I'm saying 90% because I am excluding the megalithic structures. But we can do, but it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be something quick, okay? And I give you my personal experience. Uh, in my new house, I love to have uh, a layer of granite uh, in my kitchen, on my kitchen, okay? And uh, I, I moved like four times. So the last time I asked uh, the one I deal with to bring me a Swanian granite. He was trying to make excuses not to bring granite, uh, Aswanian granite. And I know why. He expected that, I don't know. But I told him, I'm going to pay you extra. He said, no, no, this is not the, the deal or the problem. I said, I understand why. Because all the other types of granite, he can use his uh, diamond blade several times. But once he's dealing with one block from Aswanian granite, this blade will uh, work no more. So it, it will work and the granite will affect the, the sharpness of it. So he needs to buy another blade, which will cost him more. So I figure out his excuse and I told him I'm gonna buy you a new one. So you see, 
So even with our modern technology, we can do it, but it will cost us much and will take time, okay? Uh, this is very interesting piece from the Nubian Museum in Aswan. It's an ostrich egg, which is also something interesting. Why they made this type of art in an ostrich egg? And do we uh, have ostriches in Egypt? No. Again, the same story like elephant, giraffes. The Egyptian environment is not okay for ostriches. It is in Central Africa. But this is an evidence that one day we had ostriches. So if you look carefully, we have three pyramids and we have a wavy line on the east side or the right side, which is a great uh, example. If we bring the picture of Egypt, it will be the Nile and the pyramids in the same location, the west side. It could be the, the Nile and the pyramids. Yes, I think we are not imagining because of the previous story about pyramids and the story before the, the picture. So it seemed that the, the pre-dynastic people were aware was, uh, with pyramids. But this one, it talks about Giza pyramids in particular, not any pyramids. For sure, th those are the three major pyramids of Giza plateau. Another fine piece from Saqqara Museum for uh, a cover made from schist. Schist is not a hard stone, okay? It is like medium uh, level of hardness, but shaping this with uh, primitive tools will break it. It's fragile stone. And if you look how smooth it is and how shiny, you will start ask questions. If this can be done with primitive tools. I hope you can see the circles in the center the styrations, which is perfect circles. And this shows that it was done by a machine, not by uh, chiseling. Another type of stone showing the same thing, that the circle in the middle is perfect. This is all was found with what they call it pre-dynastic tombs. Uh, here we come to the uh, alabaster. Also, alabaster is not very hard stone, but very fragile. So we need to be very careful dealing with alabaster, even with modern machines. This is the plan of uh, the area under the, the step pyramid of Saqqara. And we have series of tunnels. If we put them in a straight line, it will be 3,000 meters. So imagine under the pyramid, we have tunnels can form a one tunnel 3,000 meters. In one of them, or two of them, we found 32,000 jars. Have you seen those alabaster jars? And so many of them were found just in two of those tunnels, 32,000 jars. So my opinion that those tunnels are older than the step pyramid and the step pyramid was built above ancient site. Here we come to the pre-cataclysm. What are the evidences of the pre-cataclysm? This is what we will see. I was explaining to one of the visitors and I made, I designed this uh, map so we, we can have a good idea about the Serapium. Uh, we have been to the Serapium in our tour together, remember? This yeah. underground tunnel uh, was made in a great way, very precise cut, okay, S straight angle. So uh, in, in any way to say that the ancient Egyptians made this with the primitive uh, technology, no, we can't, because of many reasons. Number one, there is no light, okay? This is underground structure. How come they provide light? Number two, ventilation. We need great ventilation there because the workers are going to die, I think, daily. Why? Because the, the bedrock is uh, limestone. A limestone is very, very similar to gypsum. When you cut limestone, it produces powder like cement or gypsum. When you smell this for five or six or eight hours, you had what we call it cemented lungs. So workers are going to die daily. 
So they need light, they need ventilation. And after this, you will find that they made perfect straight wall in each side and the, 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 the ceiling is a frame. So no way to believe that this tunnel was done by primitive people. Number two, if we skip this story about the tunnels and we can agree it can be done in a primitive way, then you will be shocked to find almost 23 boxes, giant boxes from hard stones, mainly granite, giant. Each box with the cover weighing 100 tons. The box 70 tons, the cover 30 tons. How come they did it? Seven, 70 tons after it was made. When it was a big rock, it could be more than this. Okay, and you'll be surprised to know that the, the entrance is tiny entrance, almost fit the size of the box. I measured one of the boxes myself. It is uh, 10 feet, the, the, the width of it, 10 feet, and the tunnel is 12 feet. So one feet from the right, right side, one feet from the left side, which is crazy. How come if we uh, imagine they can push or drag it and then how they maneuver because to go to the room you have to turn left or to turn right how they can do this if it's just one feet uh, wider than the box itself we need at least 50% uh, wider than the box so we can maneuver with uh, the box they can turn right or left okay so th we have so many questions in this place the Sarapio and here's the picture of it. Look, perfect cut. And I always put myself in um, the position of the worker. Doing this work in such hard, if, if we agree about the primitive story, I, I will not pay attention to such details. I will try to make a tunnel. Ugly, beautiful. I, I will not be careful to make it such a nice shape. Okay? Because it's a matter of just finishing the, the job and leave, but not creating such uh, smooth walls, straight angle. Okay. And this is the box, one of the boxes. Um, st this story was uh, told to me by Christopher Dunn, the uh, engineer, I was talking about him. Uh, he told me that he sent to one of the factories that we need to do a box like this with open budget. Don't worry about money. So they sent him the first proposal that we cannot do it like this. We will do it as five pieces, four walls and the base. And then we can put them, put them together. He said, no, we need them to be one piece. They said it's going to be too expensive. So again, do we have a technology to do this nowadays? Yes, we do. But it is not that easy. It will take too much time, too much work. Okay? Yeah, it's one, because it, these, I remember being there, and that place is, everything about Egypt is very mysterious, obviously. Um, but they were talking about how that's one piece perfectly cut, and you've got this uh, rectangle in the middle, which is extraordinary. Um, one of the questions I want to ask is there's a lot of different things, but you know the materials, right? You have all these different materials. How many, what's the furthest material like that's non-local because some of the materials um, are not, were not from around there. They had to be found and then brought in. Exactly. One of the things surprised me when I was uh, searching in the pre-dynastic uh, objects, I found amethyst. We don't have amethyst in Egypt. We don't have amethyst in Middle East. Okay, not only Egypt, there is no amethyst in Middle East. Where the nearest place with amethyst for Egypt or close to Egypt is Afghanistan. So the ancient Egyptian had to go to Afghanistan to bring amethyst. And we, um, some types, uh, some, there is some stones, I cannot tell you from where because we don't identify the stone itself. Like there is um, a sphinx in Alexandria. Uh, it, it has the same shape like the ancient Egyptian style, but we don't identify the stone itself. I can tell you that as uh, researchers, we don't know what it is. 
and we give it a, a, just a name like uh, like gray sandstone or gray uh, limestone but for sure we don't know what it is for me it is like artificial cement looks like a big block of cement but we don't have any idea that the ancient egyptian were using cement or invented cement okay Okay, here it is. So the lower part is 70 tons, seven zero, and the upper part is 30 tons above each other. Believe me, when you try to push this or to try to move it one millimeter, you can't. And when I say believe me, it is not my opinion. It is Auguste Mariette opinion. Auguste Mariette is the French Egyptologist who found this and he found all of them open except one. So he, and he is Egyptologist, and he's supposed to follow his, uh, the, the teaching or the style he was teaching people and uh, studying with, uh, with them about dragging or pushing the stones. He didn't do any of it. He brought gunpowder and he made like a dynamite, a beginning or like a primitive way of dynamite, and he made the first explosives to go through the the closed box okay so here is a very clear evidence that he is not uh, he he doesn't or he didn't agree with the primitive stories about pushing the stone or dragging the stone so to open uh, the the closed box he had to use a, a kind of strong explosives okay this is my son adam because I am trying to teach the new generations about ancient Egypt, real ancient Egypt. You know, they study uh, the same type of history, but in, in a complicated way. So they grow up and they don't feel this is make any sense, so they don't like it. So they ignore the Egyptian history. Okay, but I'm trying to teach them and telling them the truth about ancient Egypt and I succeeded. They are big fans now, my kids, big fans with the ancient, the real ancient Egyptian history. This is, look to this, super shiny surface and very ugly writings. It doesn't make sense at all. Who made this super shiny surface reflecting the, the flashlight? Is the same one with the same tool doing this ugly graffiti not of course. And this is one of the big problems in Egyptology, that writings are very important. And they date and relate the site according to writings, which can be done in any era, any time. Any king can send his workers and tell them, erase the old name and put my name. So we come in the modern time and we uh, easily uh, get uh, deceived by this layer of writings and we say oh, this piece was made by this king. And we, we have so many evidences that King Gramses II put his name on the stones or the, uh, the objects of the previous kings. Right, yeah. So when we were there, it's, a, it's basically graffiti. And yeah, yes. Yeah, when you go to um, Thailand, for example, whoever's the king or however they were, like they can just take the picture and put a new, new person on. But this, they're just doing it in, in graffiti. And the one thing that I wanted to just touch on really quick was um, just for clarity, how are you guys taught? So when you go through school, the, the traditional education is teaching um, a certain um, history that there's a lot of holes in you guys don't it doesn't there's a lot of holes and some of it doesn't make any sense but that's what's being taught in schools and everything like that and is that the difference between chematology they're using modern science and let's just say other alternative thinking rational thought just you know looking at other ideas and trying to mold something that makes a bit more sense like you know robert shock's work he's looking and he's like look we can show um from geology that this is older than what you're saying, we, we can prove that. Yes, I, I can tell you that who first used the, the term chemotology is Abdel Hakim Oyan, okay, or they call him Hakim. The man studied Egyptology like I did, and he opened his eyes when he was really young. So he wanted to fix Egyptology, but he couldn't because Egyptology became like a giant tower. 
okay so there is no chance to fix some of the of the mistakes happen so he invented this uh, uh, term chemitology which is basically egyptology but with extra way of thinking or deeper way of thinking and trying to fix some of the mistakes happen because of egyptology like i said when we deal with uh, the lost technologies so chemitology is in my own opinion, because I was considered myself as a chemitologist. But now I'm trying to say I am Egyptologist. I'm trying to join the battle and try to, uh, how do you call it, trying to uh, change it. Okay, I'm trying to bring the um, Egyptology in, in, in uh, real uh, logic or in, in, in our own logic, not to be away from logic like most of the, uh, of the people unfortunately now think and believe. And you know, the good news that so many now Egyptologists are following what, we are, what I'm saying. Uh, so many, they are trying to study with the new perspective of uh, stories. So many are uh, rejecting now the old stories about uh, primitive tools, okay? So believe me, in the next 20 years, uh, Egyptology is going to change. Okay. Ah, this is another great part. Um, I don't remember if you joined the second week of the tour or it wasn't only Cairo. It was yeah, Cairo. Right? I didn't get the second part. I really wanted okay. to, though. This is Abydos, right? This is Abydos, yes, the underground temple, the Osiris. We had a special permission and we went there. There was no green water at the time. Or there was, but in a lower level, so we could find some places to walk above. This is unbelievable structure under the ground. This structure was made again from the rose granite of Aswan, and it is massive blocks weighing more than 50 tons and some more than 100 tons. And here's the question why is the need for such heavy weight? A block of two tons or um, five tons. Let's say 10 tons is more than enough, but you are dealing with 50 tons and with 100 tons. So could you imagine the extra job or the effort for the workers cutting this from the mountain and moving this to the side? And, you know, to move this, as I said, one centimeter, it's a great job. Okay. So why they didn't save that kind of big problem and they bring blocks one tons or five tons? which is, will be very good. But because we are not dealing with regular function, we are not dealing with regular tools. The pe people who made this, they were capable to do it. And the reason to do this was something important. So this size was needed. This size was made to serve certain function. Okay. When you see the other temple, the regular Abydos temple, you'll find that it was made of uh, sandstone and limestone. And there is great art was done, but you can say that not the same tool uh, was used to do both of them. This needs advanced tools. Closer picture, so we can compare between the size of the, uh, the man, the guard, and the step blocks. Here is Dr. Robert Schock in one of my tours. And we, as I told you, we are using science. So when we say this site doesn't belong to this era, we are not just imagining because we are depending on science. We are depending on analysis. We are depending on geology. This, okay. Will you one minute, please? I will come back. I think Muhammad's going to get into it, but Abydos also has a flower of life etched into one of these pillars perfectly. Um, hey, hey, Muhammad. Yes. This is the site where there's a flower of life perfectly etched in one, one of the blocks, correct? The Osiris, yes. Exactly. You can see the head of the man. It is just behind him. If you look to the screen. 
Yeah. And what does it look like? I, I, I've heard a couple of different theories, uh, like kind of like etched in there, but, but it's... You look, could be uh, like because a- I made a private visit several times and I was very, very close to it. No, it is just drawing. Red ochre. It's not etched. It is not laser. Uh, it is not carving. No, just a, a very simple uh, drawings, which for me creating more questions because drawing this, uh, it, if I train somebody to, to do this, it will take weeks to train him to do it perfectly. Okay, so someone will come and will do this on the wall. And by the way, it is not just one because uh, the shade and uh, the, the, um, the angle is far from the, uh, when, you, when you are in this level and you don't have the permission to go down, you see only three, one big and two small. But in total, there are nine in the area, in, in both walls. There are nine, okay? And they are perfectly made. There is no mistakes. There is no wavy line. It is all perfect. So, but by the way, this is uh, not the only place we have this. We found the flower of life on um, a cover of a wooden uh, plate. Uh, it is in Brooklyn Museum now. And I found one myself, okay? It is my own discovery. I was walking in Elephantine Island and I found a broken uh, piece of jar from pottery. And I, when I took it to see it, because, uh, you know, I, as I told you earlier, I like to look and to uh, question everything. So I don't leave any stone without I having a look. So I looked to it from inside, inside the jar which was a surprise to me, they made the flower of life drawings. I took a picture of it and I left it there. But when I went in another visit, I didn't see it anymore. Okay. But I was lucky that I I took the picture of it. This is a a block from Alabaster in Saqqara. And we can see it was cut by a saw. No other chances to explain that there is something else can cut this. But here is the question. Is this a regular sew? Do we have this sew? Like the question you asked me, can we do this in modern time? With this way, no. Why? Because it seems that this is not a straight sew. It's a circular sew. And according to the diameter and the angle, this sew is huge. Can be like 50 meters the diameter can be very, very wide, not less than 20 meters. So to complete the circle from this angle, we are talking about something giant. And when we get closer, we can see that the, the blade of the saw was shaking somehow. That's why it gave us two levels. Can you see? Okay. But this is the best way to cut alabaster. If you look to the left corner, it's again a fragile stone. So if you cut this with a hammer or a chisel, it will keep fragiling. You will not reach a smoothed level easily. The only way to do this is a fast, quick blade. So you can reach smoothed side. And this is the famous books in the Egyptian Museum, the unfinished books from granite. And it shows, again, it was cut by a blade, not by uh, a chisel. And here is the problem. Egyptologists found themselves in a, in a big problem. That according to all the chisels we found, there is no a single iron chisel was found during the Old Kingdom time. All of them are copper. No one from, <laughs> from iron. So they built an opinion and they said iron wasn't used during Old Kingdom. It was used closer to the Middle Kingdom. But here is the question. Can iron, can uh, copper cut granite? No. Actually, the way around. Granite can cut copper. Copper cannot cut granite. Granite can cut copper. <laughs> okay. So how come they cut this? With what? So they came up with some strange stories that they use harder stone doing this. Okay. Another 
type of uh, drills. It's uh, uh, like um, a circular drill on alabaster also, which is not very strong material, but very sensitive material. And it needs a sensitive tool to, to do this. Another type of uh, drills. And you can see the styrations. And I was told in my last tour with uh, Dr. Uh, with, uh, with, uh, uh, Christopher Dunn that according to the shape of the styrations and how close to each other it is, we can determine how fast was the blade. So according to this picture, this is a very, very fast machine. Not just something can go slowly. Now this is very fast machine. Could be like our technology or even better. Look, precise cut. And nothing can do this except advanced machine. Because I am dealing with, I'm talking with you from a point of view of also um, a country boy, okay? Uh, I was dealing with tools and I was trying to do things like this when I was young. I was using drills, hammers, chisels. So I am aware with what I'm saying. I'm not just behind the disc uh, imagining that this is, could be right, this is, could be wrong, no. In many days, in many times, I was using tools like this. So I understand the effect of the tool. When it is uh, uh, okay to, to call it uh, a primitive or like hand, regular manual tool, or when we talk about advanced tool. This one from Giza Plateau. And we can see that the core is still attached. So we are talking about very slim blade the same size of a coin. So as if you have the, the coin and that, which is impossible because if we have a blade with this slim sides, it means that the blade will melt while spinning in granite because it will be extreme uh, heat and there is no water. How come on the big machines, we, they provide water system to cool down the blades. But this one, it's, this is from the top, like uh, the, uh, the door jam, the upper door jam. Okay, you call it door jam, right? Or the, the front part of the door, the higher part? You know, we, the door, okay? Like the, the top frame? part of the door. Yeah, like the, the frame? Yes, but from inside. Yeah, I got it. Yeah. Okay, so <laughs> I don't this... exactly know what the word is, though. Okay, so this, because the, this used to be where they put the hinge of the door, so the door can open and close, okay, so it is in the top. So there is no any chance that they can pour water above the blade so it can cool down uh, the heat. Uh, this in Alexandria, I was just telling you that you need to go to Alexandria, one piece of rose granite, 28 meters. One piece, perfect pillar, round, straight, soft, everything. There is no mistakes, okay? One piece of rose granite, 28 meters. What's that piece called? Pompey's Pillar. They give it Greek name. <laughs> and they claim that it was done during the Greek time. And of course, I'm destroying their story in, in many ways. <laughs> This is another great piece. And we have one of our friends uh, uh, giving us the, the scale. This stone is not hard stone, okay? It is um, sandy stone. But this type of stone is the hardest ever because sandy stone like this we, was forming millions of years ago and it was collecting uh, flint. On it. So it is not pure sandy stone. It is sandy stone filled with flint, flint stone. You know the flint? This hard stone? Okay. So that's why we call it conglomerate stone. Flint is one of the hardest stones, sometimes more than granite. So dealing with flint, cutting flint, they need super tool. 
Okay, our tools can cut flint, but it's not so easy, and will not be okay for the blade. So how come they made a whole statue with lots of details and the muscles and the decoration of the the belt and the uh, the skirt and the facial details and the ears, and they have such hard material like flint in the stone itself. Why they didn't go for uh, another easy material like limestone or regular sandstone? Because they have the tool to do this. And, and who was that a picture of and what is that called? This is Amun Hotep the third statue. Amun Hotep three. Standing statue. Those are belong to him also, but sitting statue and megalithic statues. Those statues are weighing more than 700 tons. And it was one piece. Now they are cracked, but they used to be one piece. Imagine that you go to the quarry and you cut one piece of a stone, 700 tons. And it was more because when it was one block, it was like 1,000. But after carving, it is almost 700 tons. Yeah, I remember watching uh, an Egyptian documentary before I went to Egypt and the person who did it, I can't remember what it's called. It could be the Pyramid Mysteries or something. It was the one of the French uh, women. And it just talked about the biggest mystery being how the heck did they quarry the stones? That's the, you know, you can't, yeah. you can't pass go until you get that. Never mind the construction and everything else. How the heck did you get the material out of the quarry into where it needed to be? Because that apparently is the hardest thing. Look, let me tell you uh, what I found in geology books that to cut a, a small block from one meter long, you can cut it from anywhere in the quarry, okay? Two meters, then you will go, you will look for certain pieces. Three meters, your options would be limited. Why? Because of the cracks, the natural cracks, okay? Because you need one solid piece, right? So one meter, the cracks will be, distance between the cracks, easily one meter, one and more, one or less, okay? Two meters, little options, three, four, five options will be very hard. But more than 10 meters, you need to go under the ground. Then you have better options. But going under the ground, it means extra job, okay? So to cut 20 meters, you go 40 meters under the ground. We have an opalisk 34 meters. So it means that they went 60 meters under the ground. Because one piece like this, long piece, without any cracks, you, you need to go very deep under the ground. But closer to the ground, because of the vibrations, because of the earthquakes, we have cracks, natural cracks on the surface of the quarry. So this is completing what you were just saying, that cutting the stone itself is a great challenge. We are not talking yet about how they shape it, how they move it. Just to get this block out of the quarry is a great challenge. This is one of the obelisks. We call it the unfinished obelisk of Aswan. And this is supposed to be the biggest one ever made. Uh, we estimated the weight to be 1,200 tons. Imagine they were planning to carry 1,200 tons. They had a plan for this. Otherwise, why they were finishing it, okay? 1,200 tons. And cutting this, it's, it's a big mystery, but my big problem there, how they're gonna take it out? Because it is in the middle of the lower level of the quarry, and there are high edges surrounding it. So you must take it up first and then out. And when I say out, it's not, it's not that easy because there is no regular way to go through. It's not like a, a, a street or like a path. No, it says a mountain shape or like, a, you know, that kind of rocks. Okay. So if you have a group of 10 workers, you cannot go as one group. You need to go like one line behind each other. So how come they were planning to carry this with which tools? Okay, with aircrafts, maybe. Do we have aircrafts can carry 12 tons? Well, uh, sorry, 1,200 uh, tons? I'm not sure. This is me and Robert Schock uh, in a private visit with the Sphinx. 
and again the Sphinx we can easily now uh, dating the the Sphinx to be older than 11,000 BC because all the effects and the erosions above the body and the surrounding area happened during the rainy season 9000 BC okay and the Sphinx were there because the effect happened on the body but when actually it was made we are not very sure but it is older than this time and the picture with the Sphinx everybody visited the Egyptian Museum he saw this shape as a regular plane a toy but someone from NASA I forgot his name in the 70s when he saw it he called it he called this as aeroplane uh, sorry uh, everybody saw it uh, he saw this like a bird regular bird okay but the, the NASA man called it aeroplane and the first point that the tail is not the tail of the bird it's the tail of an aeroplane the, the, the bird tail is horizontal not vertical okay and the wings and then the details of the body itself but for me it is enough to watch the tail and to make sure to say that for sure it is not a bird it is an aeroplane this is the Serapium in as a, sorry the uh, Ramesseum in Luxor uh, another giant piece one statue one piece from rose granite of Aswan weighing around 1,000 tons. 1,000 tons, one piece, after it was made. And here is my family. Remember I told you I'm trying to teach them real history, okay? Me and Nassim Haramein, we made live video while we were in uh, Ramesseum explaining the, the statue. And if you look to the head, you can see there is a cut in the middle of the head so we understood that some people some groups of workers was using this as a big quarry to cut slices from it so they can use it in different purposes they couldn't cut the head after cutting like 20 centimeters they lost hope it is great challenge for them because what because they were using primitive tools so they couldn't finish the job. Inshallah, in the future, when you join one of my tours, we will go there and I will show you how they were trying to cut a slice from it, but they couldn't. That's why they left the job. And then they claim that they cut the whole thing with primitive tools. No way. And we measured uh, during uh, the same tour, we, we measured the base because when we say 1,000 tons, without the base, the base itself, 700 tons. So in total, the statue and the base, 1,700 tons. With what tool they can move this? It, are you saying that they were one piece, the base and that, or was it two no, separate pieces? Two pieces. Two pieces, yes. okay, got it. Okay. Wow. But my point again, uh, to make it simple, why they didn't make the statue without the base? They can put the statue on the ground. Why they need a base to be 700 tons? You imagine they put their workers under great pressure. Again, unless they know that they can do it easy. And as I keep saying, the only uh, answer for how they did that is, of course, uh, advanced technology high-tech and number two they must have anti-gravity lifting way okay without anti-gravity solution they cannot do anything like this when we talk about the Great Pyramid we talk about uh, almost uh, two million six hundred thousand blocks imagine two million six hundred thousand blocks how many days we need to do this job how many years Okay, if we talk about uh, moving, uh, cutting the stone from the quarry and moving the stone to the site and then building the stone and then adding the, 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 the last layers. So we need 300 or 400 years 
doing this with our modern technology. I'm not talking with primitive ways. With our modern technology, to finish 300, uh, 200, 6, 2 million, 600 thousand clocks, we need 300 years at least. Okay. So the only solution that we have uh, high tech plus anti gravity solutions. I think uh, this is, was uh, a beginning of uh, the, <laughs> the opening the eyes of uh, the audience that ancient Egypt is not one layer. Ancient Egypt is at least two layers. It could be more than two layers. Uh, ancient Egypt did great job. Uh, Dynasties also did great job. But there are some structures cannot be done by dynasties. Okay, it was done by earlier ancient Egyptians with better technology than the dynastic technology. Because when we compare between what was done by the dynasties and some of their uh, objects or uh, structures were done in a great way, but still not the same uh, problem or the same challenge like the uh, Ramses statue, like the Great Pyramid, like so many other sites, okay? Uh, so, yes, as I say, uh, we are knocking the door. We are trying to make people aware that uh, ancient Egypt is deeper than we are thinking. I hope wow. you enjoyed this presentation. <laughs> yeah, th well, thank you so much for that. Yeah, all you did was basically break my brain even worse from like when I went there and have just a hundred million questions. Um, but I appreciate you and in, in sharing that in the research and just opening up, you know, and that's really where it is right now. It's this mystery, trying to find mm -hmm. solutions of how the heck was this done? How mm -hmm. did it happen? Because the story that we're being told right now doesn't really make any sense. It doesn't cut it. There's something else that we can explore and we can communicate about and uh, think about because these are big questions. These are big holes in the story. So, um, you know, there's a thousand questions I want to ask you. Um, and I know that we can go deeper on so many different sites, the Sphinx. Mm -hmm. We didn't even touch the great pyramids, uh, more on Abydos cause there's just mysteries all over the place, but, um, I want to be respectful over your time and definitely have you come on and, and we can talk about each of these things. Um, mm -hmm. I guess the only question that I'll ask is, um, and we'll dive in deeper next time for sure. Um, you know, what do you think, you know, do you have any idea who built the pyramids and what purpose? You know, some of the, the you could either maybe share some theories that you've heard that you kind of resonate with um, or, or ideas. So, cause that's going to be the biggest question. And I'm curious and I heard all kinds of excellent ideas um, with the resident science foundation, but really we don't know for sure right now. Look, my own opinion, that the builders of the pyramids are humans, okay? Number one, are humans. I am not a big fan of uh, extraterrestrial people or knowledge, okay? Maybe I agree with, uh, like, um, how do you call it? The, the ancient Egyptian in their drawings, they were showing that they receive from the stars, okay? But I don't think that the, the simple way, like we think aliens, no, the, I think they were talking about energy receiving energy and they receiving waves and maybe transmission or something but so far i am not convinced even one percent that um, any other race or, or people or like somebody except humans who did this because my story about human that they were created in a golden age the early humans were super smart they were using 100 percent of their brain power now we are using 13% maximum. So what happened to the 87%? This is the gap we, we have. With every disaster, with every cataclysm happened, with every solar flare, uh, humans had to hide under the ground, had to escape, disconnected with nature. That's why the, uh, some of the glands and their brains were affected badly, so they lost some of their brain power. You know, I will tell you something that sounds uh, crazy. Uh, in the American movies, they show Superman uh, losing power 
and when they expose his body uh, or uh, when the, the sun beam touches his body, he receive, he gets the power again. I see this is uh, something from the ancient story that when human disconnect with the sun, they lose their brain power. Okay, so I think the, the pyramids were built in a medium time uh, when humans realize that they are using, losing uh, part of their brain power. So they built a pyramid to help them uh, energy, maybe transmission, maybe uh, to stabilize the, the, the main uh, gravity of Earth. Uh, by the way, the, the pyramids are built over the major ley line on Earth. So if we talk about electromagnetic energy, it is there, okay? The style, the shape of the pyramid from engineering also is a producer of energy. And electricity could be like uh, something tiny in compared with the energy we are talking about. Uh, so my guessing that humans, and if we talk about race, would be Egyptians built the pyramids. But not all the pyramids, because not all the pyramids are reflecting the same high technology. We have some pyramids for sure built by the dynasties. But when we talk about the major pyramids, like Giza pyramids or the Ashur pyramids, they need great uh, knowledge to build them. So I'm not big fans with the... Uh, the primitive stories that they were built by primitive tools, primitive ways, or the alien stories. So I, I am taking the side of humans, and to be more specific, the side of the Egyptians, ancient Egyptians. I like but again, that. As I, You're as taking I the middle about, way. Yeah. <laughs> 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 um, well, okay, well, yeah, there's so many questions I want to ask you, but we're going to have to do a round two, but one of the one of the ones that I'm curious about is, you know, there's a lot of stories. There's like occult schools, you know, there's, there's um, all this mystery around Egypt and these mystery schools and things like that. Um, what do you think about all of that? Can you like summarize that? Like from a, from a chemitologist perspective or an Egyptologist, like you've got, you know, Thoth, I don't know if you, what's the pronu right pronunciation of Thoth? Is it Thoth or Toth? What do you say? Okay. It is uh Tohot, actually, if we follow the ancient Egyptian way, it is Tohot. Ah, there you go. All right. Can you see? <laughs> tohot. Exactly. Right. But, nice. but think Toth because Tohot is T and they add H, like, like also Hathur. It is not Hathur. It is Hathur. Okay. Uh, so, um, yes, look, unfortunately, when people started to think about the uh, Egyptian civilization from a different perspective, uh, they became groups. So when I say mystery school, it's supposed to be one, all of us in one mystery school. But the problem that each one of us trying to make his own mystery school, we try to say, I am the one who discovered everything. No, we are completing each other. Okay, we are, um, we shall, the same like in, in, in as any other field. If you are one group, you will uh, find more, you will uh, be more effective. That's why I, like from your show, I need to call them and tell them, let's be one group, okay? Be in many groups, that is not helping the story. Because some people, they come to you and tell, tell you what I'm saying, but they add something or they take off something. So the message will not be clear and they can easily be attacked by other group. Okay. So um, I, of course, I agree with the, with the term mystery schools, but as one school, not many. And by the way, we don't uh, have one identity for Tos or Tohut. They are two identities. Tohut, the, the Ipis bird, and he is in the same time the baboon. Like one coin, two sides. And the baboon is Jehuti. Jehuti. Right. And so can you give a little bit, um, just to like a little bit of an understanding on, on some of that history? Maybe not too much, just like a bit. Okay, quickly. So the ancient Egyptian represented or considered 
Tuhut or Jehuti as a netter of knowledge. And uh, he has two identities to show that one of the identity is self-aware, uh, or how do you call it? He, he was born smart. He was born knowledgeable. And he knows the knowledge because he is connected. The second one, the baboon, he is learning. He is watching. So he got the knowledge because of observation, because of teaching. Okay. And I think this was made to help uh, both groups because some people are naturally smart and they can uh, figure out things without teaching them. And other people, they study and they show that they are good students. Okay. So Tuhut or Jehuti are both of them in one coin. And he is connected with, uh, not when we say knowledge, he knows everything in the proper place, in the proper time. Okay. And he married Sishat, also a lady of knowledge. But Sishat is more concentrating in the cosmic uh, uh, information. So Tuhut and Sishat are creating a, a great uh, sphere of knowledge in Earth and on and the universe. Awesome. Well, well <laughs> I better I better let you go because I, I my mind is just opening all the way up. But yeah, this was a really good um, start, and I would love to have you back on share more about what you know, more about your research. Um, appreciate everything that you're doing and putting together and. Uh, nice to see you again. It was an amazing experience in Egypt, and I can't believe it's taken this long to, to get you here. Um, my fault, because I got distracted with life. Um, but <laughs> but um, I, before we go, is there anything that you wish that I had asked that you want to leave the listeners with? Um, no, but uh, my message to them that uh, keep reading and keep uh, searching for the truth. But don't underestimate the others. This is what I think. Like, uh, let's try to prove what we have, but we, we, we must, because this is what I have seen in the last 10 years, that to prove myself, I like uh, insult the others. Okay, so this is my message. message. Don't insult the others, but try to show the, the evidence and to, even if you don't have evidence, but at least try to show your story in a proper way. Yeah, this that's a, my message. This. That's a really good message. And, you know, I think it's important because you have you're going, uh, let's uh, against establishment, right? This is school systems. And then this is also, uh, you know, universities and things like that teaching this. Um, right. But we need to, I think, for those people listening, that goes against the grain, they need to be open minded uh, with new information, you just take the information, um, and, and the tools that we have to, to learn and to grow and if you're presenting new knowledge do it with um humility um you know like i remember seeing robert shock's presentation to like i think it was the egypt board or whatever that is and they, they weren't listening to him and he's like this is like geology you can't disprove this like this is mm -hmm. the most sound thing you have to accept this you can't just be forcing this down people's throat when we have different information so i and i and i understand too it wasn't easy um, in Egypt to speak about these things even or to share them mm -hmm. it's not even safe or not not only nice like not good like you, you get like tomatoes thrown at you um, so yeah. I appreciate you having the courage to share that and I support your work um, and I like your ideology everybody share what they know be open mind to the other and be respectful and we, you know that's it so makes sense um, so what, where can people, do you have a website or anything where people can find out more about you if they want to learn more? Uh, I used to have a website. Now I'm dealing with my Facebook group guide of Egypt. Okay. May in the near future, I'm going to have guide of Egypt also a website, but uh, I'm, I'm still in the process building one. So the only thing I have is my Facebook group, uh, guide of Egypt. Right on. Cool. Well, thank you so much for coming on. I uh, appreciate you very much. And let's definitely stay connected and do this again. Okay. You are welcome. All right. <laughs> bye See bye. you later. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Peace. Bye.